We think we know what inflammation feels like, but I'm gonna paint a very clear picture for you so you know pretty much exactly what it feels like when you're walking around with inflammation all day. Okay, now this video is gonna be about fasting and how it affects inflammation, but I just, I have to paint this picture first. Imagine you're going for a run. Okay, you feel really good. You're going at a slow pace and you feel great. But then you start breaking into a sprint. And when you break into a sprint, suddenly the run doesn't feel so good anymore. You get tired, you feel fatigued, and eventually you're gonna to have to stop. Well, the reason this happens is quite simple. Okay, well, when you are going slow, you have oxygen coming in and the oxygen is combining with glucose and it's giving you energy at a nice steady stream. But when you break into a sprint or you start running up the hill, your overall supply of oxygen can no longer meet the demand of the activity. You're working harder and you just, you can't get oxygen in fast enough. So you start breathing hard and you feel tired. Okay. Well, why this happens molecularly is very simple. Okay. When you are aerobic and you're just moving slowly, you go through what is called oxidative phosphorylation. This is where your body combines oxygen with glucose to create energy. And that process creates 36 units of energy per glucose molecule. That's a lot of energy. But when you start running uphill or you start sprinting, you switch gears and you're no longer utilizing oxygen. Okay, you're creating energy from glucose via glycolysis. That only yields two units of energy per glucose. Do the math, 36 units versus two units. Okay, you're gonna feel tired. Well, guess what? When you have inflammation in your body, you are largely running on the anaerobic glycolytic system. Inflammation uses the running uphill or sprinting process, which is why you just feel run down and fatigued. But it does this even in the presence of oxygen. My point with all of this is that when you have low grade chronic inflammation, it's like one part of your body is sprinting up a hill and the other part of your body is just trying to just go through daily function. That is the clear picture. Hey, I do wanna make sure you hit that red subscribe button and then please do hit the bell icon and select all notifications. Don't hit personalize, select all notifications. That way you never miss a beat. You'll always get notified of our daily videos. Now, let's talk fasting. So fasting is going to improve our mitochondrial function. It's one of the reasons why we feel so energized, right? We'll talk a little bit more about that. But when we have inflammation, which quite frankly is happening to a lot of us anyway, we have what is called more reactive oxygen species. So more oxidative damage occurring in the mitochondria. The mitochondria is where we produce energy. So if we're producing energy in the mitochondria, but we have what's called reactive oxygen species affecting the mitochondria, it drills holes in the mitochondria. Now, I know this sounds complicated. Please, please, please stick with me. Okay, the mitochondria produces energy, but when it gets damaged, it gets holes in it and it leaks DNA and it leaks energy. It's like trying to mix uh, some batter or something in a colander versus a bowl. It's all gonna leak out, you're gonna lose your ingredients, it's just not efficient. You might end up with a couple of cookies, but a lot of them are gonna end up on the floor too, right? So this, in turn, triggers a bunch more inflammation, it becomes chronic, right? It just becomes a vicious cycle. The reason that I bring this up is because when we look at fasting, fasting improves the mitochondrial efficiency and it improves that mitochondrial density. So it makes it harder for holes to get drilled into the mitochondria. So that's just one simple way, but let's get a little bit more science scientific here. Let's look at the immune system here. Okay, we have these things called monocytes. Now monocytes are largely associated with chronic inflammation and one kind of monocyte is called a macrophage. Now macrophages are involved in wound healing and they're very, very, very important. Okay, so imagine this. You've got a wound, macrophages and white blood cells are going to go to that wound and they're going to encourage healing. They're going to encourage basically building of fibers to heal it. Well, this also occurs with the liver. If you've ever heard of someone having a fibrous liver or liver scar tissue, this is exactly what's happening. Liver gets damaged, so macrophages come in and do their job like they're supposed to and they heal the liver up. Well, they heal it with scar tissue, not with functional tissue. So the liver actually becomes, well, somewhat more useless, right? Well, where does fasting come in? Well, this is where a study that was published in the journal Cell demonstrated some interesting stuff. They found that a 19-hour fast reduced the circulating levels of monocytes and macrophages meaning, well, we have less of this low-grade inflammation or unnecessary wound healing that's occurring. That's good news, right? That's really good news, okay? Now, additionally, why this is occurring is because for whatever reason, it is reducing the number of components that would normally recruit white blood cells out of the bone marrow, okay? So these monocytes that we talk about that are involved in our immune system and are involved in inflammation, good and bad, they're born and they live in the bone marrow. 
and they get recruited out of the bone marrow and they circulate. Well, it turns out that for whatever reason, intermittent fasting decreases the amount of recruitment. So you're pulling less of those monocytes out of the bone marrow. Now, in addition to that, it's also been demonstrated that these monocytes that are able to get out of the bone marrow are secreting less of their cytokines. They're less effective, or they're less overreactive, if you want to call it that. So in short, while you're fasting, you legitimately seem to have less inflammation. This is a very good thing, and it's quite frankly why you feel so energized and probably feel so clear. How you feel when you're fasting is just a peek into the window of what it could be like to live without a bunch of inflammation. I don't want to jump out on a limb and say that it's how we should feel, because I guess that's somewhat subjective, but the reality is that's what it feels like to have less inflammation. Now, it validates some of the things I've talked about in other videos with the immune system and uh, immune system being compromised during a fast. If you have less circulating monocytes and less circulating macrophages, it does potentially mean that you have less ability to fight an infection at that point in time. So it may not be the best thing for the short-term ability to fight off an illness, but it's definitely a good thing to fight chronic inflammation. You have to do the balance and again, make a judgment call where you want to have modulated inflammation and where you want to have enough inflammation. But let me give you a little bit of peace of mind here. It has been demonstrated that 20 hour fasts do not seem to affect the ability to fight an infection. Now, additionally, it has been demonstrated that six weeks of intermittent fasting, like intermittent fasting frequently for six weeks, doesn't seem to negatively affect the ability to fight bacterial infections. However, when you start fasting longer than 24 hours, for example, a 48 hour continuous fast, there is a decrease in the ability to fight an infection. So it's all about the balance. I'm more of a fan of shorter fasts, okay, like 16, 18, 20 hours, a few times per week, versus doing just a long fast and then not fasting for a period of time. You're just crushing your immune system. But this is why you feel such, just so good. You have such less inflammation potentially. I do wanna make a brief note that I've created some intermittent fasting grocery boxes with Thrive Market. Thrive Market is a huge supporter and sponsor of this channel, so a huge thank you to them, but also extending everything out to you. So if you use the link down below after this video, you can go to Thrive Market, which is an online membership-based grocery store. But the cool thing is I've been able to create specific uh, intermittent fasting boxes and keto boxes and thyroid support boxes, et cetera. So what these are are boxes that I've assembled with grocery items that I would normally get. So it's like you're going grocery shopping with me and you can choose the things that I would choose with a couple clicks of a button and then it's delivered right to your doorstep. So Thrive Market is super awesome and they have been absolutely imperative just for me being able to function and keep my pantry stocked during everything that's going on with quarantine depending on when you're watching this video. So point is, check them out down below in the description but please watch the rest of this video so you get the whole picture entirely before you check them out. Now I wanna tell you about Damp and Pamp. My friends, Damp and Pamp. Sounds like a Dr. Seuss book, right? Well, Damp and Pamp is probably one of the most important things overall that you should really be paying attention to. Damp stands for Damage Associated Molecular Pattern, and Pamp stands for Pathogen Associated Molecular Pattern. Let me explain what this means. Okay, Damp and Pamp kind of work together in tandem sometimes, but Damp is the immune system's sort of response or signal to something that is damage related. Let me give you an example again. Remember that mitochondria thing that I talked about where the mitochondria gets a bunch of holes in it? Well, when the mitochondria gets a bunch of holes in it, it's going to release its own DNA because it has holes in it. It's a colander instead of a bowl now. So all of its innards just kind of leak out, right? So when the DNA leaks out, your body's immune system recognizes that and it says, uh-oh, we have damaged tissue, we have a damaged component of the human body, we need to just get inflammation going, even though realistically the inflammation might not be able to do much in this situation, it's just a natural response. Okay, it's like the analogy I've used is you have a boat, okay, you're out on that boat and all of a sudden you see a little bit of water in the boat. Well, your damp alarm goes off because the damp alarm that is notices, uh-oh, there's damage to my tissue. There's damage to my vessel, to my boat. Means you have a hole in it, which means you need to start bailing water out and you need to activate the immune system to plug the hole, okay? So we can see how this would trigger chronic inflammation, right? It's just damp is a signal when we have damage in our body that inflammation is going to be just constantly at this little low. You're constantly having to bail out water, making you tired, exhausted, inflamed. Now let's talk about PAMP. Our friend PAMP is very, very similar, except PAMP is pathogen associated, meaning external. Okay, DAMP is all about what's happening inside your body. PAMP is about what's happening coming in your body from the outside. 
Now, in the case of an analogy, a good comparison here to damp being a hole in your boat, PAMP would be like you finding uh, mouse feces or, or rat feces in your boat. Okay, it's something external, but you know there's a bigger problem. Okay, you have mice and rats that might start eating your wiring and leave you stranded in the middle of the ocean. So your immune system goes to work to start investigating and finding the problem. You see the pattern here. Okay, we have damp, internal, and PAMP, external. However, we have to look at our gut, and I'm getting to the whole point about fasting here, so please stick with me. I know this is kind of a funny story and fun relationship, but I'll get there. Inside our gut, we have an ecosystem of things that are supposed to be contained there. They should not leave. It's like a hermetically sealed area of our body. But what happens is when we have inflammation, which a lot of us do, we have components called lipopolysaccharides. Okay, these are little suckers that live on the bacteria in our gut, and they're supposed to be there. But what happens is they leak into our bloodstream. When they leak into our bloodstream, PAMP elevates because PAMP says, uh-oh, we've got a pathogen. Even though it's in our body already, it's still a pathogen because it's not supposed to be there. The immune system recognizes it and says, boom, let's go to work. But there's some good news here. There's a lot of evidence that shows that fasting increases the stability and the structure of your gut mucosal layer, giving you an additional layer of protection from those lipopolysaccharides getting into your bloodstream. Okay, Scientific Reports had published something that took a look at 20 women and it found that when 20 women restricted their calories and did time-restricted eating type stuff, well, they had a big increase in their gut mucosal layer, so their protection, but they also had a subsequent decrease in lipopolysaccharides within their bloodstream. That's just with caloric restriction. So obviously you can do the math. Fasting definitely can be a big, big piece of reducing PAMP. So ultimately, fasting reduces DAMP and it reduces PAMP. It's kind of like thing one and thing two from Dr. Seuss, right? The last thing we have to talk about is the relationship with NLRP3. Newsflash, and I know you may not like this, intermittent fasting does produce ketones. You do not have to be eating a ketogenic diet to produce ketones. Fasting will produce them too. And there's a lot of bodies of research that show the relationship between ketones and what's called the NLRP3 inflammasome. Okay, now let's dive in a little bit deeper to what this means. There's a study that was published in the Journal of Experimental Neurology, okay, and it specifically was looking at NLRP3 and it was looking at uh, ischemic strokes. Okay, so when someone has a stroke, you have a degree of what's called necrotic tissue, right? So tissue that dies. And this tissue that dies, well, guess what? It leaks DNA, just like the mitochondria leaks DNA. That triggers damp, right? That, well, a lot of this damaged tissue is a result of NLRP3. NLRP3 is just a, an immune system response, but sometimes it can cause damage. Well, as a result of that, you have an elevation of what's called nuclear factor kappa B. This is all a bunch of acronyms, a bunch of weird stuff. The point is, is that ketones have been shown multiple times over to modulate NLRP3 and modulate nuclear factor kappa B. What this means is when you get into a fasted state, you have these ketones that are present that allow your immune system's response to be a little bit more targeted. When a pathogen comes into your body, it's normal to have a full-scale attack at first, right? You have just this big, almost bombing that occurs. Just boom, 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 boom. Let's try to annihilate the pathogen. But you want to have like, I don't know, a bazooka or a rocket launcher. You don't want to flip the switch in a nuclear weapon, right? So if we can control NLRP3 inflammasome via ketones, we can make it so that the NLRP3 inflammasome is a little bit more targeted, okay? Versus just exploding the world, you're exploding the area that needs to be exploded. Now, realistically, as far as what's in the science, there's probably a good five or seven other ways that intermittent fasting modulates inflammation. But I wanted to paint a clear picture for you so you knew what was going on. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.